In addition to the poem itself, I would like to speak about the poet, which becomes a much more central issue than it did when we looked at the Odyssey and the Iliad, notably because we don't know who Homer was. There was the Homeric question that is still at play, who is Homer? Is Homer a collection of people? Is Homer a singer? And there are scribes writing the text down. We don't really have a biography of the poet from the eighth century. And we're not even sure about the exact timeline in which Homer composed his poem. It's different when we get to Virgil. We have quite a bit of information about the poet himself. himself. And when we look at the poem, we'll notice that it begins with I, arma varumque cano. I sing of arms and a man. I sing. We don't have a mention of a muse for quite a few lines. Instead, it becomes about a person, a particular poet singing this song, singing this story. And the I plays a part in the composition of the text. Virgil himself was a poet who had already made a name for himself in Rome, writing the Ecologues and the Georgics. The Ecologues are pastoral poetry. The Georgics uh, are about the life on the farm. And by the time we get to the Aeneid, the Aeneid is being requested of him. If you remember the Roman history that I mentioned, we had quite a bit of civil war. We have unrest. And as Caesar Augustus establishes himself as the first citizen of Rome, he needs to create a myth around himself that solidifies his power. And he does this in order to keep peace and to establish reforms in the country that will secure this peace, again, law and order becoming central to the Roman understanding of their empire. And he does this by being a benefactor of poets. And he needed to provide um, the nation with a story of, of his rise to power and how it was legitimate. We don't have a series of kings that are passing down their power. We don't have a monarchy that is established by God the way you would uh, in the stories of England or France, for example. Instead, you have someone who has risen to power by conquering their enemies. And um, the stories of Rome's founding were not even legitimate as a powerful, peaceful nation. Um, the original myths about Rome that it told about itself was rather... Um, untoward <laughs> and uh, the myth was that you have Rome opens its doors to convicts to the you know second son in the family to the poor to the marginalized and says please come and join our new country and when they don't have any women in that country and it's just a land made up of men they famously go and take uh, the Sabin women and they rape the Sabin women and make them their wives in order to produce Roman children. So it's rather, rather a, um, a problematic myth about the founding of the country and needs to be replaced by one that is more legitimate and shows the noble character of the country. And this is why Virgil begins his poem the way he does, by looking back at Troy and at the city of Troy, which had a nobility about it. We have the memories of Hector being this grand citizen that kind of epitomizes everything it would look like to be um, a citizen of Rome. And so he reaches back and makes the Trojans the heirs of Rome and retells this story. So Augustus asks him for this propaganda, propaganda not in the sense of uh, the fascist propaganda, but in the hopes that it would solidify the law and order that he so desperately wanted for the new empire. Unfortunately, Virgil, during his time with uh, Augustus, as he was going to visit Greece and learn more about uh, how to write his poem well, about the culture, he was on a trip with Augustus and caught a fever and died in 19 BC and was buried in Naples. He actually wrote the inscription that was placed on his tombstone. And what it says in English is, I was born in Mantua. Mantua made me. I was born in Mantua, um, and I am actually being buried in Naples. Um, and it, it calls him the poet of pastures, countryside, and leaders. Pascua rura duces, um, of the pasture, 
of the countryside and of leaders. And these were his three great works, the Epilogues, the Georgics, and the Aeneid. When he did die in Naples, he asked his friends to burn the Aeneid. It was unfinished. It was left with different lines don't fill out the hexameter properly. They only have um, a few beats in the meter, and so they're left with several feet missing. There are places that seem inconsistent plot-wise or character-wise in the text or that actually speak against one another, and people assume that Virgil would have gone through when he revised and clarified some of these points or made them match up better. Perhaps the ending of the text, who knows, wouldn't have been the actual ending of the text and it would have gone on. Um, some people wonder if he was going to write a 24-book poem and that this, these were just the first 12 books. I disagree with that because you have the perfect six parallel with the Odyssey and then the perfect six parallel with the Iliad and it seems like a complete, as I've said, condensed version of the Odyssey and Iliad to outdo both of them. Uh, I don't think it would have been enhanced anymore by 12 more books <laughs> to be added to it. But it was not burned. Augustus stepped in, as we mentioned, he was the patron of Virgil at this time, and he stepped in and refused Virgil's dying request to burn this poem, which most of us for the last uh, thousand years, 2,000 years, have been very thankful that Augustus stepped in and that we still get to have the Aeneid. The Aeneid opens, arms and a man I sing, the first from Troy, a faded exile to Lavinian shores in Italy. On land and sea, divine will and Juno's unforgetting rage harassed him. War racked him too until he set his city and gods in Latium. There his Latin race rose with Alban patriarchs and Rome's high walls. Muse, tell me why. What stung the queen of heaven? What insult to her power made her drive this insignium pietate virum through so many upsets and hardships? We're going to be using Sarah Rudin's translation of the Aeneid. And uh, Professor Rudin made several choices in this translation. She does emphasize the opening of the poem, which follows very closely with the Latin arm of Arunque Cano. She also makes the choice to um, try to keep the iambic pentameter, which is more closely associated with English, but that we have the sense that it is, in fact, a poem. You'll notice it does not rhyme the way some people have chosen to translate the Aeneid, um, but it's very clear language, very accessible language which makes it ideal for kind of walking through the first time if this is your first go with the Aeneid. The opening lines do not tell us who the poem is about. Unlike when we looked at um, the Iliad and we have Sing of an Achilles' Wrath, we don't have mention of Aeneas in the opening of the poem. In the Odyssey, it takes us 21 lines before we get to find out who the complicated man is that Homer will be singing about. So in that sense, it more closely resembles the opening of the Odyssey. We also have some of the key ideas that are all listed in the first 11 lines of the Aeneid. First, arms and a man I sing. So we have arms, we have the war. Uh, this latter half of the Aeneid will talk about its own Iliad and of a man. We have the journeying man, the pilgrim, who is going to actually return to his home, which is not his home. It is a new Troy. And this becomes a driving myth for later cultures. The idea of the new Jerusalem, the new Zion gets picked up here with the new Troy. And of course, when we have America, we have Virginia being named after the queen. We have a new England, right? We have this place that is a resettlement of the things that came before and yet has its own identity and its own sense of being different also from what came before. The opening lines of the poem also tell us who our villain is or what is the force that is against Aeneid. When we looked at the Iliad, we had the Trojans versus the Greeks. And even though it is Achilles' wrath, Really, the Trojans become somewhat of our heroes more so than Achilles does. When people read uh, this story of the barbarians versus the civilized, they are more on the side of the civilized Trojans than they are the barbarian Greeks, even though it's a Greek poem composed by a Greek author. <laughs> 
when we get to the Aeneid, a lot of these ideas of the Trojans will be reversed as we'll see um, Aeneas acting like an Achilles in this narrative as he goes to found uh, Rome. And uh, you'll have the characters taking on some of the same attributes as the heroes of the Greek epics, but these are the Trojans this time doing it. Arms and a Man I Sing, this, as we've mentioned, is a story by Virgil. We have the poet very much involved in the, narr in the narration of the story. And Juno's harassing rage is the impediment. If you remember from the stories of the Iliad and the Odyssey, Juno is angry with the Trojans for several reasons, and this will come out in the Aeneid. First, because her husband's uh, illegitimate son, Dardanus, was the founder of the Trojan race. Dardanus supposedly came from Italy, and that's why the return to Italy is an actual return for the Trojans, the return from their founder's birthplace. Secondly, if you remember the judgment of Paris, that Paris chose Aphrodite, who will be known as Venus in the Aeneid, chose her over Hera, and Hera still finds this a slight against her beauty and still holds on to this as a reason to hate the Trojans and wish to see them fall. So it wasn't enough that their city was razed to the ground. It wasn't enough that um, many of the Trojans died. Most of the Trojans died or were destroyed. She wants to smite every single one of them. She wants to destroy them, even though she knows that Aeneas is fated for something else. She continues, as this text says, to harass him over the course of the story. In addition to Juno's rage, we want to talk about fate, which is also mentioned in these opening lines. The fate that drives Aeneas, this sense of fatum, I will unpack a little bit more later, but the gods or Jupiter or an outside abstract idea of fate has decided that Aeneas will found Rome, that this is unavoidable, it is not something that he can fight. Um, if you think about it as a chariot, as one scholar has mentioned, he can either drive this chariot of fate towards his destiny or he can be dragged behind it uh, to accomplish the will of fate, but it will be accomplished. We have a sense that Aeneas is the kind who will drive the chariot. And you get this from the last line, line 11, in which the poet refers to Aeneas as insignatum, sorry, insignium pietate virum, meaning the man signified by his piety, the man who was known as pious. Uh, so several times his epithet will be pious Aeneas, Translator Sarah Rudin has chosen to use synonyms, so sometimes he's the loyal Aeneas, he's the dutiful Aeneas, um, but his piety is a term that we'll have to unpack as well. It's not one that we saw in the Homeric world, but it's one that becomes central to the understanding of the Roman world.